Hello, I'm John Grom, and welcome to the 61st Right and Left Discussion Forum. The purpose of our discussion forum is to demonstrate that an open mind, the willingness to seriously consider the opinions of others, plus civil discourse, can lead to the discovery of common ground. Today, our panel will discuss gun control, or more to the point, violence control. Today's panel, beginning on my left, is Patty Haskins, retired math teacher and current member of the Wadsworth City Council. On her left is Tom Finley, the retired Vice President of Human Resources Development for Rubbermaid uh, Incorporated, and current partner with the Great Lakes Resource Center. On his left is Dr. Natalie Sidorenko, writer and educator. On her left is Brian Lawbaugh, president of R&B Financial Services. Today we're going to depart from our usual format of having panelists make an opening statement. Instead, the moderator will make an opening statement, and then the panel will join in at will. The opening statement is as follows. Mass shooting is defined as a shooting with four or more victims. Approximately 200 mass shootings occur in the United States each year, some attracting a great deal of media attention, resulting in calls by activists for new gun regulations. These measures come up because they're often seen as a quick and easy uh, fix, and uh, some like background checks have proven effective. Others face opposition where unrestricted gun ownership is considered a basic freedom. Some measures like gun registration face stiff resistance from a well-organized pro-gun lobby. Some of these reforms would have little effect on gun violence and still others are just plain illegal. These um, uh, regulations that are called for usually include uh, background checks, registration, sharing of mental health and criminal records, bans on semi-automatic rifles, and more police on the streets. While these measures may have broad political appeal, they do not address the root problem of gun violence. While mass shootings are terrible, they amount to only about 200 out of 34,000 shooting incidents each year. They account for only a fraction of gun homicides, and the preoccupation with rifles is way out of proportion to their use in homicides. The Center for Disease Control reported that in a recent year, 2010, there were 11,078 gun homicides in the U.S., but only 358 involved a rifle, or about 4%. The vast majority of firearm deaths in this country are with handguns and are largely ignored by the media, politicians, and activists. They are the result of our misguided war on drugs. The war was launched in 1971 by Richard Nixon. Presidents Ford and Carter added little to it, but Presidents Reagan and Clinton put it on steroids by providing large grants and incentives to increase the number of drug convictions, resulting in the incarceration of hundreds of thousands of minorities and severe post-release penalties. Black youths are disproportionately targeted by the incentives provided by the federal government because arrests and convictions are more easily obtained in dense, low-income minority populations. They become part of a black prison population that exceeds over one million. The result is that hundreds of thousands of convicted drug felons eventually re-enter the general population and thanks mainly to President Clinton, are ineligible for public housing, welfare, or food stamps and with nearly zero opportunity to survive in the legal economy. The drug trade is seen as their only option. They become involved in a business with an extremely high mortality rate, which accounts for many of the 7,000 black-on-black homicides each year. I don't think it's a stretch to say that our biggest public safety problem is not guns or mental health. It is a race issue, and we need to face it head on. Now, I'll open up to the panel. Any questions, comments, attacks on me personally? <laughs> uh, <coughs> the, the race issue, uh, I think, is uh, a misnomer. I don't think that's an accurate uh, focus, John. 
I, I think it's the word that's the focus is violence. It's not just guns, it's violence. Uh, and is there an acceleration of violence? Uh, or is it media? Is it population growth and there's more of it? I don't know the answers to these questions. I'm just saying that to focus on anything, you often need to make sure you're not focused on symptom and not, and, uh, not focusing on the cause. This is certainly, I think, true here. So I'd offer those. You don't believe that the, um, the war on drugs is uh, partially responsible for the tremendous amount of black on black homicides? Well, absolutely, and it's responsible for a lot of other negatives <coughs> in our culture mm -hmm. because it's ill found. It's a perfect example of focusing on symptom mm -hmm. as opposed to cause. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I notice is whenever there is a mass shooting, uh, as opposed to the black on black crime like you might see in the inner city, that there is a you know huge number of people that come out with different reforms that they feel will solve the problem. <coughs> and when you're speaking about violence, reform is never going to cure violence. Violence is something I think that's part of the nature of some human beings. And, but there are things that can be done. I know the big cry is to treat the mentally ill. I agree with that totally. However, I think the big thing you have to do is you need to keep guns out of the hands of mentally ill people. I mean, it's the fact that someone's mentally ill that doesn't kill the person. The fact that that person has a gun and shoots someone, as we saw with the reporter and uh, her cameraman last week, <sighs> that is what ends up shooting someone. You see a lot of other reasons, and there are those that say that guns have nothing to do with it. Um, but no matter whether it's a shooting by an immigrant in California, whether it's a shooting of small children and a pastor in South Carolina, whether it's the shooting of a reporter and a cameraman in Louisiana, or the shooting of between gangs in Chicago. The one common thread that they all have is a gun. Correct. I just heard on Fox <coughs> News this morning, Fox News this morning, that there are 88 deaths per day by gun. And that's 80. And most of them are what? It, they did not say the type of gun, but they said 88 deaths per day. Mm -hmm. Because we're not just talking murders, we're also talking suicides. But if you, you parallel this, though, with uh, a gun being a weapon, and I'll go back to violence again, uh, how we don't record or look at knives and the amount of mayhem with a weapon called mm -hmm. knives. I, I think it's, it's more, it, it's easier to kill someone. Well, of course. With so, a, I mean, if. For example, that it's, case of the reporter and the cameraman, someone comes up with a gun, I mean with a knife, you can run away. The gun, it's a little mm -hmm. tougher it's to do that. It's pretty final so, too. But, and, uh, yes. I think it's kind of hard when you start um, you know, putting a particular type of weapon. I would say that anybody that kills somebody with any sort of weapon is mentally ill. Um, so the system seems to break down when we get into racial issues because and I would agree that there are some symptoms that are out there that are created by their environment and that environment leads to black on black crime it leads to gang related crimes most I would say when you look at the statistics most of the murders that are happening the hom homicide that are black on black in Chicago inner cities like New York and stuff our, our Baltimore, our drug-related, gang-related activity that whether or not you had the most stringent gun restrictions, which Chicago has, mm -hmm. the criminal will find the gun. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, I'm for responsible ownership of guns. I'm for, um, you know, individuals, uh, you know, if you're going to get a, a permit, you should have classes. Uh, there should be a an, an education component with that. But, but I don't know if we can just make that leap and say, well, if we take away the guns, we'll have less a crime. And I don't believe that because the criminal will always find the gun. Case in point, just recently, uh, if you watch the news, 
uh, five people on a train in France, three of them were Americans, rushed an individual. France has some of the most restrictive gun ownership uh, laws. That crazy, that mentally ill, crazy person who believes in a certain thing, you know, whether you want to uh, uh, put him as being a, you know, a, 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 a Muslim, a, a fascist, or whatever you want to uh, label him, he had an AK-47, which is a semi-automatic rifle with multiple magazines. He had a gun, he had a box cutter. He was prepared to do a lot of damage on that train. Mm -hmm. You know, this system, and you can't blame it on, but, but he was cultivated. That individual was cultivated through a series of, uh, 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 you know, interactions with, with terrorists. Now, if France has this issue, and mm -hmm. all these other European countries that have very strict gun control, the criminal is always going to find the gun. So I don't see, given you know, the, the the honest person will turn in their gun. They register their guns, they go through the training, uh, and and I just find it hard to make the leap to say we take all the guns and we will have less. You, you know, know. I, I don't think that's what I was <clears throat> saying to take all the guns, and. One note about the case in France is that he was take, they were taken down by three unarmed men mm -hmm. who attacked them. The problem I have whenever there is a gun shooting here, the reaction from some tends to be arm more people. And I can't imagine what that would have been like on that train had there been 15 other people with guns and you had a shooting. <clears throat> uh, the NRA board member, Charles Cotton, went so far as I found this appalling. After the shooting at the church in South Carolina, he went on record as blaming the pastor who was shot and killed because he had voted in the South Carolina state legislature against concealed carry laws. And I, you know, well, saying that reactions, overreactions, you know, uh, just so uh, distort yeah. the, the rational approach to this that mm -hmm. we, it's, it's really difficult to sort out. And when I focus on something like this, and John, you said the race issue, I said, well, what about our history? And I immediately went to how we tried to deal with the American Indian, if you, if you look at the race side mm -hmm. of that. And all of the Violence. incompetencies around the rules, the regulations, uh, the enforcement of, mm -hmm. were just disastrous. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with the black race. Uh, here, it's rules were put into place that have affected them far more than any other race. Are you thinking well, in terms of the war on drugs right now? When you I'm looking at the war on drugs, yes, as, as just an example of mm -hmm. implementing uh, reform or laws that were just mm -hmm. focused on the wrong thing entirely, and then someone suffers. And, and so you look at the, uh, the Indian, you look at the blacks, they mm -hmm. are the worst victims of that, if you will. Stanley, I can't believe you've been quiet this time. I was going to speak, but then Patty wanted to jump into something Brian said, so I wanted to let her, her her have her retort. But I wanted to say something. I agree that violence is the issue here, not just guns. It's violence, overall violence. I want to ask Brian a question because I feel like you're using this term in a generalized sense, and I agree with you if that's how it is, so I just want to ask you a question. When you said, I think anyone who murders another person or kills another person is mentally ill, you're saying generally good people who are rational are not going to kill other people because I'm worried about the mental ill label and here's why. I don't want these people getting off in a court of law because they're all mentally ill. Right. Do you see what I'm right. saying? I right. believe yeah, I some people do it intentionally. They're right. completely in their right mind. Right. They absolutely need to pay the ultimate penalty. Right. right. So no, am no. I understanding yeah, you yeah. correctly I, I, don't, there? I certainly don't want to disparage the mentally ill. You can make the argument okay. we're all a little bit crazy. But, well, sure, but, but I'm but saying like true mental illness, schizophrenia, are, bipolar, people are, that are suffering there, with that yeah. is there, different there than... Are, there, mm -hmm. are people, there are people out there that uh, within their character are, are basically killers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I wouldn't... And, and if you could say they, 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 they populate a small slice of the mentally ill. Right. Okay. Yeah. There are people that are just, you know, downright you know, willing to kill somebody. And that's... And, and those are the people that, that create a lot of the problems. But, 
I would say that you, there's got to be something a little off with somebody. Absolutely. And okay. that's, that's where I think the violence culture comes in. I'm not sure, Patty, if we're born with that, if that's in our nature, because I don't feel that. Although, I did write to all of you an email. When people hurt animals and hurt children, I do feel violent inside. I do feel yes. like yeah. I want we all have justice, retribution yeah. towards those people. Well, you shouldn't have a gun then. But I don't have a gun. I don't own a gun. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, ever, as all of you know, I'm not a fan of guns. I don't own a gun. I'm, but I don't take it away. I mean, I have lots of hunter friends. I don't take away anyone's right to own a gun. I have most of my friends own guns. That's not the issue for me. The issue is what Tom brought up with violence. It's not the type of mental illness that I think we could use it as an umbrella term is the systemic problems socially in America. The fear culture that the media propagates, the um, deep divide in equality when it comes to education, access to health care, <clears throat> access to jobs. Mm -hmm. The point that John brought up, if you're a convicted felon, how do you reintegrate into society? How do you get a job? How do you earn back trust? Especially if your felony, quote unquote, really should have been a misdemeanor. So I think there are a lot of problems that... that add to the, the culture of violence, fear being the number one thing. Mm -hmm. And if we could be more communal and more loving towards one another, as cheesy as that may sound, I do believe that reduces mm -hmm. violence. I think when you're not afraid of someone else, mm -hmm. when if you're different but you don't fear that difference and you get to know somebody else, you can work together much better to create a more peaceable world. Do I think there will still be crazy people that kill others? Absolutely, and not just with guns. I think they will use their bare hands if they wanted to. Um, but I think that violence is very pervasive in our culture because of this fear, competition, lack of resources, environment that we've created mm -hmm. for, for decades. But uh, when you get back to what you were saying, you know, when you, when you get into the weeds a little bit on the war on drugs, most, uh, uh, over 50% of those that were convicted were dealing crack. And that's, that's where Bill Clinton and his administration got involved because crack was just decimating communities, mm -hmm. not just low-income black communities, but Hispanic communities, white communities. And so they went after and they made those laws tougher for the dealer. Mm -hmm. And most of those people that are sitting in prison on the three strikes you're out were dealers. It's not the person out, you know, you might find it interesting. If you want to go on early in the morning and watch Judge Collier's court, there's a lot of heroin. Tons That's the of drug heroin. Now. That's the drug now. That's, That's the, the drug exactly. now. Exactly. The drug for there are a lot of young right. men and young women coming up that are users. And, and I'm, I've been impressed with his court with the amount of help that they're trying to get these, That's important. these mm -hmm. young men and young women. Yeah. And even older young men <clears throat> and young women. And yet they keep coming back. And yet back. they keep coming yes. back. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're given a very simple set of instructions. Yeah. They can't comply. So l we, we need to look at that. And then the violence mm -hmm. that goes along with the drug culture. Yeah. And the, 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 the ancillary crime that goes along with the drug culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a tough situation, but I think there's some answers there. I want to circle back and reestablish this connection between gun violence and race. Uh, and um, and you can't do that without connecting with the uh, the war on drugs. The uh, the war on drugs became a battleground for politicians uh, in the uh, the 80s, 90s, and, and a little bit later. And they tried to outdo each other on how tough they're going to be. When they established the incentives for state and local law enforcement to run up big tallies on convictions, um, they made it so advantageous for, the, for metropolitan areas because you could, you could get more convictions in a shorter period of time. I mean, you can get a lot of convictions in a six-block area of Harlem, uh, more so than you can in Wadsworth, even though we have a, a heroin epidemic here. So they tried to make it really, really tough, and um, when uh, Clinton uh, went into the presidency and there was a, an awful lot of pressure on him to do something. <coughs> he decided when it came to 
a, the restrictions on a, uh, uh, a convicted felon. The three strikes you're out wasn't bad enough. In fact, he said, I'm not going to let the Republicans outdo me on this. When it comes to a drug felony, one strike and you're out. When it came to public housing, when it came to welfare, when it came to food stamps, one, one strike and you are out. So this guy gets out of prison. And he may have been put there on a, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. The guy gets out of prison, he can't get public housing, he can't get welfare, he can't even get food stamps. As a matter of fact, if he's got a wife and kids living in public housing and he moves in with them, they all get evicted. That's how tough these things are. This guy doesn't have a choice. He only knows how to do one thing. And he went to a graduate school at the federal penitentiary and learned how to do it even better. He goes back into the drug trade. Which is also an indictment on our prison systems, John. Like, you could absolutely educate people in prison. But it's, a, it's, it's, it's it an is. extension of the military-industrial complex where the crime yeah. is just escalated in the prisons instead of yeah. any type of reformation. Do you <laughs> see our present legislature doing anything to lessen that, though? Uh, the, the war on drugs? Well, no, but this, I have I have an yeah. idea. You I, have an idea. I have an idea. I'd love to hear it. Okay, if you can, if you would take the lobbying power of the NRA, the uh, Urban League, the NAACP, the Rainbow Coalition, and bring them all together, together. all together to fight. This is a serious problem, and it's of interest to all of them. We have every time there's a gun incident, we have people that are not trying to attra not attacking public safety. They're attacking the NRA. This is, a, this is a, a personal fight they like to have. The NRA, although the current leadership, could, uh, they should be changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, the, the fact is that there are so many people in, on both sides of the aisle in, in our legislature that are beholden to the NRA. Exactly. Including Harry Reid and um, exactly. a, a lot of other people. That if you could find some genius that may be running for president right now to come up with a plan to bring these people together in a coalition to re do something about the, the war on drugs that everybody acknowledges at this point, since Michelle Alexander wrote her book, mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. New Jim Crow, uh, that it is causing a huge problem. Uh, we, it's, it's been discussed, and I, I will give credit to the uh, uh, to the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. This is one issue that they've taken up. In fact, it's one of the reasons they're attacking Hillary Clinton uh, is because uh, she was part of the Clinton administration that endorsed these rigid restrictions on, on ex-felons. I wanted to make one more point. Ron sent me an article uh, by Steve Chapman of the Chicago Tribune. Yeah. And, well, just very quickly, makes the point that in uh, states like Vermont, where Bernie Sanders is from, mm -hmm. he, he, will not, he will not favor gun legislation because he would not get elected re back to the Senate if he did in Vermont. The fact is they have a high, high, high percentage of residents of Vermont and Utah, and Montana, and other places, very high percentage of gun ownership, very low gun homicide rate. Because they're more homogeneous states. They're not as heterogeneous Absolute. as states with big yeah. populations Absolute. of different types of Absolutely. diversity. Yeah, but you do have, like, I think, Red where there's 90 guns for every 100 people I would, in the United States. Well, which I'd is like to make this uh, point with uh, not much discussion on it, just the fact that uh, early on I said if we would focus on causes as opposed to symptoms. In the war on drugs, John, you've referenced several times, that's a perfect example of symptom. If you examine, <coughs> that's an economic solution. If you take the profit out of selling drugs, mm -hmm. it goes away. But of course, that's a whole another discussion for this group. <laughs> yeah. If that were to occur, yes. how would the you MPP, do it? The MPP, there is a strong lobby called the Marijuana Policy Project, the MPP. They've been active for years. They've pointed out exactly what Tom is saying. If you remove the 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 attraction and the draw of the economic <coughs> stimulus from the war on drugs on both sides, mm -hmm. for the criminals and for mm -hmm. the counties and states that get if bumps for that. If, there's if you no take profit. that away, a lot of that problem. Isn't that an issue on the ballot? 
It is. In this November. Yeah. Well, for mm -hmm. Ohio. It yeah. has. Uh, what it, uh, what it uh, implies is that you're, you're going to, some way, shape, or form, supply those drugs free to those people who need them. And that looks at a whole other set of problems and solutions. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, if there's no <coughs> profit motive, mm -hmm. the cartels are not going to send it to this country. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the fact is, every time that there's a big gun event in this country, the media makes a big fuss over it. The activists come out of the woodwork and they suggest things that don't have any connection at all to gun, yeah. gun violence. They want to attack, I mean, uh, when you think about and same for the other side. I mean, one side says, we need more guns. See if everybody was armed, this wouldn't happen. And well, the other side says, we I, need I, no guns. I understand If nobody that. had guns, this couldn't happen. Both are totally wrong. It's about responsible gun ownership. It's not, that, neither mm -hmm. side, that's not a solution to the violence issue. But when you think about the overwhelming majority of these uh, homicides that are done with handguns, why in the world do we attack assault rifles? It, we attack them because the NRA is going to resist. And that's who we're attacking, is the NRA. We're not attacking a problem of violence. We're attacking a, a target. Mm -hmm. we're, yeah. we're attacking uh -oh. a uh, an enemy. So, so we, we, we go out, we go after rivals and clip sizes uh, in, instead of the yeah. real problem. I think that if the National Rifle Association was the NPR, or, or, or yeah NPR instead of the uh, NPA, National NR, NRA, <laughs> if it was the NPA <laughs> instead of the NRA, the National Pistol Association, yeah. <laughs> it would make a huge difference. And we might be able to cut down on some of the homicides. Or National Protection Association. Yeah, but what we're saying really essentially is the 7,000 black-on-black murders don't really matter. You said mentioned, what, 85 a day? 88 a day. 88 a day. And we don't, pay, we don't pay attention to those. We, no, don't, we don't. We don't really care. We don't. They're not the high-profile killings. Mm -hmm. so well, what makes it done. they should be? And that's why the Black Lives Matter movement started. I know there's been some backlash and people are like, well, no, what's the White Lives Matter? No, they started. White Lives Matter because we're considered unmarked. In academia, the terminology is marked and unmarked. We're unmarked. We just are the norm. We just are. Black persons are marked, so they don't count for so many things that we count for. That's why they're saying Black Lives Matter. Why aren't you putting the stats on our deaths, our lack of education, mm -hmm. our poverty? Because yeah. we are human too, and we are Americans too. Oh boy, too. you just gave so many reasons to continue this program, but we're out of time. <laughs> Sorry. And thank you very much. But I would like to end with a very quick quote, quote from J.C. Phillips, who's an author. Anyone can shoot a gun, but the real power comes from nonviolent means. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs>